licenses. From FIFA and NBA to James Bond and Mickey Mouse. Licensing a popular name or character has often become a quick and easy way to generate piles of cash from something that would normally be regarded as lazy and uncreative schlock. However, as lucrative as it is to sponge off the likes of George Lucas, Michael Jordan and Vince McMahon, sometimes publishers just can't afford to foot the bill. So have to be a little more <coughs> creative with the legalities of obtaining said license. So this episode, we take a look at these skin flint software, these tightwad titles, and these penny-pinching programs that were so cheap that even Baldy Locks himself would have been ashamed of them. But, hello you, I'm Guru Larry, and I'll welcome you to Fact Hunt. Five unbelievably cheapskate game licenses. Undoubtedly the hottest movie of 1982 was dystopian sci-fi thriller Blade Runner, starring Harrison Ford and Rutger Hauer. The film would go on to become a cult classic and one of the most iconic movies of the decade. Fast forward a few years to 1985 and movie licenses are becoming hot property in home micros of the time. So it only seems natural that somebody would try to acquire the rights to Ridley Scott's classic. So step forward CRL who had already tasted success with licensed games based on War of the Worlds, Terror Hawks, The Rocky Horror Picture Show, and drug fueled psychedelic kids TV program, The Magic Roundabout. So what's so cheapskate in acquiring such a massive movie license, Larry? I hear you ask. Well, it's because CRL didn't actually license the film at all. Put off by the cost of the license and associated royalties, they decided to license the movie's soundtrack instead. Yep, that's right, the blooming soundtrack. Instead of being based on the film, it's actually a pixelated reimagining of Van Gelis' musical masterpiece. In fact, the cassette inlay to the game even states a video game interpretation of the film score. In hindsight, it probably was a wise decision, as the game turned out to be complete arse, trashed by the press and gamers alike. So who knows, maybe the boss of CRL wasn't a complete deckard after all. <laughs> Poor old Atari 7800 was very much the ginger-haired stepchild of the later 8-bit console generation. Going up against the NES and Master System, it never stood a chance against the seemingly bottomless money pits of Japanese giants Sega and Nintendo. Atari was still finding their way after the takeover by hard-faced former Commodore founder and Mr. Toad lookalike Jack Tramiel. So combine a lack of cash with a man famed for not spending it, and you have the perfect storm for a cheap cop-out license. And in 1990, Atari delivered exactly just that with Midnight Mutants, one of the final games for the world's first backwards compatible console. In fact, this license is so cheap that it doesn't even appear in the name. You have to take a look at the box art for clues instead. After closer inspection, you will see both the name and likeness for actor Al Lewis, aka Grandpa Monster from the popular spook filled TV show that bared his character's last name. Of course Atari couldn't mention the Monsters, or even the name of the person he played, so they just refer to him as Grandpa. So to hell with forking out for a 30 year old license of a long cancelled TV show, let's just spend some money on a drawing of that old bloke who played a vampire in it. <laughs> Grandpa doesn't even portray the main character in the game either. He just takes the role of an advisor, popping up with clues to help you save him from his pumpkin-shaped prison. Well, at least Atari made sure he could definitely tell it was him though, as his grinning, pruny old face is pretty well drawn. Unlike many other games on this list though, Midnight Mutants was actually a pretty decent game. A Halloween-themed isometric adventure, it remains one of the best titles released on the ill fated 7800 and definitely deserves a larger audience. Interestingly, Al Lewis also appeared in the movie Gremlins 2, yet he's nowhere to be seen in the video game adaptation of it. Coincidence? 
No, of course bloody not. I'm not going to rely on convoluted theories on my show. Outside of the world of TV and movies, the area that's been attacked most by the dreaded license is the world of sports. In fact, so much that you'll barely see any serious sports games released these days that don't carry the name of some sort of brand, organisation or overpaid athlete slapped on the front. So with so many big names about to choose from in the world of football, that's soccer to our American viewers, why on earth did French publishers Ubisoft pick out former Republic of Ireland international David O'Leary? Well, it could be because he was cheap, because he's absolutely totally unremarkable at his job. We don't really want to single out poor old Dave himself for any abuse. After all, he had a pretty successful career as a player, having won numerous honours in his years with Arsenal and Leeds United, gathering up a pretty substantial 68 caps for his country along the way. He didn't do too badly as a manager either, reaching the 2001 Champions League semi-final with Leeds before being sacked just over a year later. A similar fate followed after several years as manager of Aston Villa, before ending up in the football wilderness of the United Arab Emirates for an ill-fated nine-month stint as boss of Al Alai. But the big problem with this product is that Ubisoft decided to base a whole game on the success of that one Champions League semi-final. And let's face it, David O'Leary isn't exactly Alex Ferguson, Arsene Wenger, or even his successor at Leeds, former England manager Terry Venables. As during his entire management career, he won a grand total of zero trophies. So, not really a good fit for the face of a football management video game, is it? <laughs> And for our fourth game, we are once again back inside the moth-filled wallet of our friends at Atari, with another horror-themed license that takes a rather backwards route to obtaining some much-needed recognition. Only this time, Atari sourced the world of literature to make a connection, rather than chasing B-list celebrities. One of the highest grossing films of 1992 was Francis Ford Coppola's romantic horror Bram Stoker's Dracula, with an all-star cast including Gary Oldman, Keanu Reeves, Anthony Hopkins, and everyone's favourite shoplifter, Winona Ryder. It grossed $216 million at the box office, and was soon snapped up by Columbia Pictures' parent company Sony for a video game adaptation on her own ImageSoft label. Not wanting to miss out on a fantastic opportunity, Atari picked up the rights for the actual Bram Stoker book itself from the owners of his vast estate then promoting it as the official video game of Bram Stoker's Dracula, rather than the official Bram Stoker's Dracula video game. Yes. Confused yet? Well, audiences certainly bloody were. But all credit to Atari for being boxing clever here, with the game even getting a starring role in the popular UK gaming show Bad Influence, as well as becoming the cover feature of CVG's popular handheld magazine, Go. Even more interestingly, Dracula the Undead marks the only likeness of everyone's favourite Dracula, the legendary Christopher Lee in a video game. Whether Atari actually paid to use his likeness though, is another matter. But based on their history of licenses, we're guessing that they didn't. Poor old Chris. Now, the final game on this list is probably going to fly right over the heads of our international listeners, but it was just too absurd to pass up. Released in 2007, Chegger's Party Quiz is the absolute definition of shovelware, a term that the poor old Wii became almost synonymous with over the years. Well, before soft modding, anyway. Our protagonist, Keith Chegwin, rose to fame back in the mid-1970s, when at the tender age of 17, he secured a role as a presenter on the Multicoloured Swap Shop, a BBC TV show which ran from 1976 to 1982. This made a household name of the Merseyside lad we'd all come to know and love. Well, some of us anyway. 
But despite making more than 7,000 TV appearances during his career, he just couldn't let go of the fame. And this game was far from his worst cry of desperation. This is because in the year 2000, good old Cheggers, finally sober after years of career destroying alcoholism, agreed to become host of the new Channel 5 game show, Naked Jungle, where he appeared naked except for his Indiana Jones inspired hat. He identifies this show as his worst career move of his life. Well, yeah, no shit, Keith. Are you sure you were sober when you signed that contract? Thankfully, there's not a wrinkly old todger to be seen anywhere in Cheggers Party Quiz. Just a bland trivia game held together by some badly rendered recreations of Keith himself, and the premise of a party that never really gets started. It's hardly a surprise that Cheggers' last TV appearance saw him getting booted out of the Big Brother house, the final resting place of all washed up celebrities. Well, that's some YouTube. <laughs> Hello you! Thanks ever so much for watching! Be sure to subscribe to be first to see future Fact Hunt episodes. Click on the bell if you already are to make sure you're notified, and be sure to check out my other episodes. And if you want to be super awesome, check out my Patreon! But thanks again for watching, and I'll be seeing you next time! Ta-ra for now!